in the book of Acts, and I went to chapter 3. And the Bible says in verse 1 that Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer. It was the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Listen to verse 3. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked alms. And Peter, I heard one guy preaching on this. He said he asked for alms and he got legs. That just came to me right, right when I read that. I remember that. <laughs> and he was preaching like that. <laughs> and, P and Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, look at us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Let's say those six words together. Expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. He did what? Walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. They must have missed the leap. And they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And the, as the lame man which was healed uh, held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's. Now that's important, greatly wondering. So I'm going to preach for just a few minutes this morning, this message called the examination of expectation. Say it with me again, what do you expect? What do you expect? Would you lift your hands one more time? Father, I thank you for the anointing in here to just teach and preach today. And we're just thrilled that your presence is in this building. The Bible tells us that you inhabit the praises of your people. The Bible tells us where two or three are gathered in your name, there you are in the midst of them. So, Father, we just lift our hands in great expectation for what you're going to do in our lives in the next few moments of time. With your hands raised, we break every generational curse in the name of Jesus. And we dismiss any generational spirit that would be diametrically opposed to your progress and prophetic future. We bind every demon. Come on, somebody. In the name of Jesus, we bind every demon. This is scriptural. We bind every demon, every evil spirit, every principality and power and ruler in heavenly places. We bind them. We push them back today. In Jesus' name, loose families, loose lineages, loose genealogies. Break a curse. Do it, Lord, in Jesus' name. One more time, y'all, give God big praise. Come on, give him big praise. God is good. So now in Acts chapter 2, we see the church birth. And the church is birth in a very demonstrative fashion. Will you say amen to that? Suddenly there's this sound, there's wind, there's fire, there's cloven tongues of fire. They're speaking in other languages to the point that when the apostles come out of the upper room, people said these men are drunk. The response of the apostles was this. We are not drunk as you suppose. They did not say we are not drunk. They just said we're not drunk on what you've been drinking. And it's a powerful dialogue throughout Acts chapter 2. But it is a setup now for the first miracle after the ascension of Christ. This is the first one recorded after the ascension of Christ. This is the first miracle ever done by the early church, the first church. It only happens 
after the church has brought structure. It initiates, this miracle is now going to initiate the pace of the church through the book of Acts. Don't miss that. This miracle initiates the pace of the church throughout the book of Acts. It establishes the character of the church found in the book of Acts. But it comes after the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When does it come? After the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost shall come upon you. So it sets the tone not just for more miracles, but this particular event sets the tone for all the moves of God throughout the book of Acts. The book of Acts is the only book in the New Testament that does not have an ending. There's no amen in the last chapter, in the last verse of the book of Acts. And that denotes and connotes the idea that what was happening there and then should be happening, happening here and now. Time did not change it. People changed it. Time did not change it. People changed it. It all started with one word. And that word is expectation. He looked at them expecting to receive something. Someone once said, we tend to live up to our what? To our own expectations. No truer word than that. We live up to our what? Own expectations. Someone else said, your expectation opens or closes the doors of your supply. Hmm. Your expectation opens or closes the door to your supply. If you expect big things to happen and work honestly for those things, they will come to you. Listen to it. Your supply will correspond with your expectation. Say this with me. My supply will correspond to my expectation. So what you expect is ultimately what you're going to experience. What you expect is ultimately what you will experience. I'm going to talk to you about three things concerning this man. It's going to take me three hours to do it. Number one is the condition of the man. Number two is the position of the man. And then number three is the reception from the man. Now watch this. The Bible says in verse 2 that a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid at daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, and he asked alms at the temple. The word lame here is interesting because it does not just mean halted, but it means stuck in hesitation. Lame. Stuck in hesitation. Hesitation can be a powerful thing if it's operating in the mode of wisdom. Hesitation can be a powerful thing if it's operating in the mode of caution. But hesitation can be a detrimental thing when it's operating in the mode of fear. When you hesitate because of fear, you are delaying destiny. Many people hesitate from taking the leap of faith because of the fear of failure. So it's not your future that is stopping you. It's your fear that is stopping you. Huh. So you must be careful that you do not hesitate in the face of fear. God has not given you the spirit of fear. Paul told Timothy, but he's given you the spirit of power. I didn't want to preach today, but I feel it now. I just want to talk to y'all, but power, love, and a sound mind. Lift one hand and say, I've got the power. Now you must believe that because if you've got the power, 
you'll stop hesitating in the face of fear. Perfect love casts out all fear. When you know how much God loves you, then you are convinced that whatever he's called you to do, you can do it with great success. So he's stuck in hesitation. He's lame. He's halted. Movement does not mean progress. Movement does not mean progress. You can be moving and not going anywhere. This man could get around, but he couldn't go far and he couldn't go fast. He could get around, but he couldn't go far because he had other people carrying him. And he couldn't get there fast. When I saw that this morning in my study, the Lord spoke to me and said, there's a lot of that going on in your church. People are moving, but they're not progressing. When you're moved emotionally, that does not mean you are progressed spiritually. So I've been praying, Lord, get past our soul and start dealing with our spirit. His condition describes his state of being. His condition speaks of his existing circumstances. Listen to me now. There are two primary choices in life. To accept conditions as they exist or accept the responsibility for changing them. Did y'all just miss that? Are you with me right now? Holy Ghost, come in the room. Wake, wake us up here now. Listen to it again. There are two primary choices in life. To accept conditions as they exist or to accept the responsibility of changing them. It's your choice. Say it with me. It's my choice. In verse 2, this man... His condition, he's laying from his mother's womb. Number one, he's born like this. It wasn't an accident that halted him. Someone did not hurt him to make him get stuck in hesitation. He's born this way. Number two, he is now used to being carried. Boy, I hope y'all hear me preach here. Be careful with people who are used to being carried. You be careful of carrying people all the time. Now, we know we're supposed to carry people sometimes, but ain't nobody assigned to carry anybody all the time. We know that four men carried one man on a roof and let him down in front of Jesus, but they carried him on the roof to let him down in the front of Jesus. They didn't carry him to carry him his whole life. Be careful of a society that wants to be carried all the time. Be careful of a society that feels like victims all the time. Be careful of a generation that wants you to carry them all the time and they don't take responsibility to change things themselves. So now the pattern is ingrained in him. How do you know that? Because he's laid in the same place, not every week, but every day. He's laid in the same place every day. He's a pat, it's pattern now. It's in him. This is life. This is how I live. I get carried every day. I'm laid down in the same spot every day. It's my pattern. Be careful with patterns. Patterns do not only form personalities. Patterns form prophetic futures. Let me explain myself. You, God holds your destiny. You hold your decisions. One small bad decision can affect you the rest of your life. Choose life and get that pattern out of you that I want to be taken care of all the time. 
I was done wrong. I'm needy. I need, I need, I need. Stop being a, a, a consumer. Start being a producer. God has anointed you to bring help, not just get help all the time. I'll get off of it because I'll wear that out. His condition has been with him long enough now that we refer to it as a time of being generational. The Bible in verse 22 of the same chapter says the man had been like that 40 years. 40, 40 years every day laid in the same place carried by the same people. 40 is the number of a generation. I call this a generational curse. We don't know if the man's married or not, but I can promise you this thing. If he's married with children, his people, have, his children have watched him. What you exhibit as a parent, a father, and a mother is likely to be repeated by those who are succeeding you. This is called a generational curse. If you don't take responsibility for yourself, you can never impact those who are coming behind you. Never allow your current condition to determine the future position of your life. Never allow your current condition to determine the future position of your life. Say this with me. God can change this. I have a responsibility. So he asked for alms. Listen to this guy. He is saying to them, show me compassion by giving me money. You know what he's doing? He's testing their religion. This is going to make some of you mad, but you'll get over it. Go, I'm going to step on your toes, go home and rub them with Jergens lotion. You'll be all right. Woo! I don't even know how to begin this. You are not assigned to give every person on the side of the road with a sign money. I did not say when you see somebody on the side of the road asking for money that you stop and not help them. I'm going to say it just like I said it the first time. You are not assigned to stop at every person on the side of the road with a sign that says, I need money to give them money. As a matter of fact, many times you're hurting them instead of helping them. This guy was checking their compassion level. Have compassion on me by giving me money. Could he have been saying, aid me in my condition? He didn't ask for healing. <laughs> he was being carried. Boy, uh, Lord, have mercy. Here's the problem. We've got a collision of two processions. You've got a man, if you can picture it in your mind, Caleb, a man being carried, passing by Peter and John. It's a collision of the paralyzed with the powerful. He's about to be set where he's always sitting. And he looks at them and he asks for money. That's what he wanted. Talk back to me. They did not give him what he wanted. They gave him what he needed. He asked for money. They gave him a miracle. When we believe as a church that money can do more than miracles, we are dead in our progress. The Bible says in the book of Ecclesiastes, money answers all things. Don't get it wrong. But it never says money is the answer for all things. In other words, money can give the wrong answer. So before you start throwing money at everything, how about reaching back and getting you some of that Holy Ghost power and throw miracles at some stuff? 
Because if you can change a man by the power of God, he can change his future. But if you throw money at him and keep him in his condition, he's paralyzed forever. I'm asking the church, where is the power, not the pecuniary, not the penny. Where's the power? I think I just lost my church here. I'm going to stay with it, though. <laughs> he ain't messing with anybody here. <laughs> He's messing with two pillars. These men had seen miracles. Are y'all hearing what I'm telling you? You know what I like about Peter and John? They were carrying themselves like they had something. Why would he ask them? The problem with the church today is we not carrying ourselves like we have the answer. We carry ourselves with slumped shoulders and held down heads, putting stuff on Facebook that's pitiful and pathetic. Instead of acting like Jesus is still the answer for the world today. Brother, if you want to be fixed and up out of your jeopardy, give your heart to Jesus Christ. Quit limping through this life, church. Acting like we like everybody else in the world. Peter and John carried them in such a way, carried themselves in such a way that they had something to offer. My question is, why in the world looking at the church like we have Something to offer because we're not carrying ourselves like we have anything to offer. We're scared of the power of God. We're scared of a move of his spirit like we had last Sunday. We're scared people will leave if folks start speaking in tongues and getting up out of wheelchairs and throwing their crutches down and running through the building by and leaping and praising God. Because we look at that as an emotional fa uh, uh, fanatics. I'm reading to you from the bearisheth of the church. This is how the church was born. And we brag about how many buildings we pay off for somebody. Or this person, we gave them all that money and bought them a house and we bought them a car. But is their life changed? Is their life changed? Now watch, that's his condition. I got two more points, I ain't gonna make it. I ain't gonna, I ain't having it today. Certain man laying from his mother's womb, they laid him daily where? At the gate, which is called beautiful. His condition tells us how he was. But his position tells us where he was. You know why I like this kind of uh, trajectory of, of ministry time? Because it separates the listeners from the hearers. This kind of trajectory of, of ministry, um, it doesn't express itself in demonstrative shouts. You know, where I'm at right here is not where I was last Sunday. You're going to at least be interested in a crazy preacher running everywhere and jumping. You're going to at least be intrigued. You might be like this, but you watch. But this kind of ministry right here polarizes listeners from hearers because of the pace of it. Doesn't lack any more power. It's just the pace of it is different, and I like it. I just needed to throw that in. So I'm going to say what I just said and see if it has a different impact. His condition tells us how he was. His position tells us where he was. Where you are spiritually and emotionally is more important than how you are physically and emotionally. Where you are spiritually and emotionally, where you are, is more important than how you are physically, financially, and so on. He is at the gate. That's important spiritually because the gate is the portal. It's the entrance into something. It's the door. 
Where did the Shunammite woman go when Elisha told the servant to call her? The Bible says she immediately went and stood in the door. The word Bethel is first mentioned in Genesis chapter 28 where Jacob has an encounter with God and he sees a ladder, angels ascending and descending. Where at Bethel? Bethel is the house of God. You know what, you know what Jacob called Bethel? The gate of heaven. What did you just say, Pastor Rick? When you're in the house of God, you're in the gate of heaven. This is as close to heaven as you're going to get before you get there. You're in the gate right now. So if we could ever learn to bring our condition and position it in the gate, we are now placed in the portal or the entry to the next room of our destiny. Somebody shout, get in the gate, get in the gate, get in the portal, get in the passage. If you came to church every Sunday thinking, I'm going to the door. If you went to church every Sunday saying, man, I'm getting in the gate today. Something's going to open to me today that's never been opened before. Optimism, enthusiasm, and expectation would not be a problem in the house of God. Because we wouldn't be able to wait to get here to get ourselves in the gate ready to go to the next room of our future. Somebody give God praise right there. Amen. God is good. 342 times does the Bible mention the word gate or gates. 342 times. I find it interesting that this gate, I told you this was important when I first read it, was at Solomon's porch. Yeah. This ain't the first time we saw this gate. This gate is mentioned in John chapter 5 where the man at the colonnade was on Solomon's porch. Jesus got there and he asked him, do you want to be made whole? You know what the man's response was? Every time the water is stirred, somebody jumps down in front of me. Notice the question Jesus asked, do you want to be made whole? In other words, I'm questioning your desire. You've been here 38 years. We got two guys right at 40 years that have stayed right there in the face of opportunity and you're saying no man will help me. And Jesus is saying you don't want to be made whole because if you wanted to be made whole, you wouldn't have waited for somebody to help you. You would have jumped in the water by yourself. Same in here. If you want it, it's here. The question is, are you going to get it? You're in the door. You're in the gate of heaven. Whew. You know what I'm praying? That God slings open to you the gate of heavenly privilege today. That whatever you've been praying about, whatever you've been believing for, that today you see a door open to you, that God begins to flood your life with every dream you've ever had. Anything you can imagine, God can do for you. Can y'all take 10 sanctified Holy Ghost filled seconds and give God a 10 second crazy praise? Tell somebody you're in the gate. God is good. Whew. And the gate is called what? Beautiful. Sit down for one more second. I'm almost done. I've got 10 minutes. Beautiful. Whew. Say it again. I'm in the gate. And the gate is called what? Beautiful. Read it in the Greek. The word beautiful means timely. It's interesting. It doesn't just mean pretty. It means timely. It's a timely gate. Not just any gate. And the Bible refers to the beautiful gate as the east gate. Anything facing east is looking at a new beginning. Where does the sun come up? In the east. The east wind in scripture is mentioned more than any other wind. It's, it was referred to by theologians as the wind of anticipation. Daniel prayed toward what? The east. The east gate. Ezekiel talks about it 17 times. You know what I'm praying for you? Face east. Face east. I'm skipping all this and I'll finish. His condition, his position, his reception. Let's end it here, shall we? I just skipped about three pages. Y'all stay with me in the back. Verse three through five. He saw Peter and John about to go into the temple. He asked for alms and Peter looked at him with John and said, look at us. I like that. 
They were not afraid to say, look at us. The church do anything but say, look at us right now. Matter of fact, church is saying, don't look at us. Look at the White House. Look at the schoolhouse, but don't look at the church house. It's the White House's fault. It's the church, it, it's the schoolhouse fault. Don't look at us. Like the church ain't got nothing to do with it. this most powerful house in this nation. I'm going to say it again. The church house is more powerful than the White House. It's more powerful than the schoolhouse. If the church house was right, the schoolhouse would be better. If the church house was right, your house would be better. And if your house was right, the church house would be better. He asked expecting to receive. When I read that, I thought, I wonder if people are still asking. James said it like this. You have not. Why? Because you ask not. Have you ever been so pessimistic you get tired of asking? Can I ask you this question? You think after Sandy Hook that people asked God to help us with schools? I believe we did. I believe we started asking like we never asked before until we got tired of asking. And then Uvalde shows up. The question is not if you're asking, but what are you asking? You have not because you ask in vain. That's what James says. You ask with selfish motives. Only time you ever ask God for anything is when it's concerning you. So you have not because you ask not. And you do not get because you ask in vain with selfish motives. Every time we ask God, it's about it. God, can you do something for me? I want to encourage you. Let's get back in the asking position. Jesus said it like this. What man is there of you, if, he, if his son asked him for bread, would, would the father give him a stone? If you ask for a fish, is he going to give you a serpent? If you being evil, and know you are, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? You know what I'm going to ask you to do? I'm going to ask you to start asking God. Ask God to heal our land. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear them from heaven and I will turn and I will heal their land. God ain't asking for somebody else to ask him. He's asking us to ask him. I'll leave it there. They ask, he asked them expecting to receive something. The word expect means to watch and to anticipate with hope. He saw them. Boy, I, I could preach all day long. He saw Peter and John. You know what that tells me, Caleb? He was aware that they were there. I, my question is, it's, it's not are you awake? The question is, are you aware? I'm getting woke. Well, are you aware why you're getting woke? Are you aware that the power of God is right there? Hmm. He fastened his eyes on them. He gave heed to them. He paid attention to them. And then he expected. That's strong stuff, y'all. Can I leave you with some encouragement? Here it is. Proverbs 23, 18. For surely there is an end. And thine expectation shall not be cut off. Someone once said life is largely, largely a matter of expectation. Someone else said whatever we expect with confidence becomes our own self-fulfilling prophecy. Wow. Whatever we expect with confidence becomes our own self-fulfilling prophecy. Expectation always precedes reception. You will receive what you expect to receive. Amen. Give you a very practical example. If you expect for people not to like you, guess what? Wow. 
If you expect for people not to accept you, guess what? His expectation, this man's expectation was a precursor, not just to a miracle, but to a movement. Because after this miracle, 3,000 people are added to the church. The miracle wasn't for him. The miracle was for the church. When God does it for you, he doesn't do it for you. He does it through you. The only reason he touched you is to pull others. And I, by this time, I saw myself sweating. <laughs> but I like this pace. This man has never moved by himself. Listen to what I'm about to tell you. His first move ever was not a crawl. His first move ever was not a walk. Mm, my God of mercy. I, I, I saw myself this morning doing it. His first move ever. Ha! Was not a crawl. And then I'd say, I can't get no help in this sanctified church. His first move ever was not a walk. The first move this man ever made was a leap. The first move this man ever made was a leap. What if we said, God, touch me in such a way that doesn't move me a foot from where I am. But touch me in such a way that it moves me to a different life. Isaiah says it like this. Say, that, say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong. Fear not. Your God will come with vengeance and recompense. He will come, God will come, and he will save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame, halted, hesitant, leap. The lame man will leap like a deer or a heart. I read this this morning. The African impala can jump to a height of over 10 feet and he covers a, different, a distance of 30 feet. Yet, you can put that same creature in an enclosure in any zoo with a three-foot wall. Did you hear what I just said? He can jump 10 feet in the air and 30 feet forward. But you can keep him enclosed in a zoo with a three foot wall. They will not jump if they cannot see where their feet will fall. They will not jump if they cannot see where their feet will fall. We got some new cattle the other day. Tommy will know what I'm talking about when we say fresh cattle. Fresh cattle is cattle that hadn't been handled. And when you break in fresh cattle, you can expect anything to happen. And it's going to happen. So we get them in the chute. And some of them's got a little brimmer in them. They're all corrientes, which means a mixture of everything. I see this brimmer coming around the corner. And I'm thinking, this cow is looking wild-eyed. The fence was about this tall going into the chute. And I saw her do this. You see what I said? Did y'all see what I said? That's Cajun for you. Not hear what I said. Did you see what I said? Yeah. <laughs> she was about right there, and she did this here. And then she just looked around like, I'm about to. And before I could get Josh's attention, I said, Josh, what? Because I saw her. When she saw where her feet could land, her next move was to look around, and like a deer, she just went, and landed on both feet, laughed, smiled, and took off. <laughs> Run to the panels, jump the panels like a deer. Now the race is on. She's out running toward the woods. And I'm thinking if she gets to them woods, it's over. It might be days. She might be at Jackie's house before we can find her. 
Jackie lives behind me back there. And we finally caught her. But the point is, she could see where her feet was going to land. And she took the jump. See, you're not operating in faith until you can jump not knowing where your feet going to land. Somebody shout it like this. Leap anyway. Yeah. The man, as soon as Peter touched him, he received ankles in, strength, in his, strength in his ankles, and he immediately leaped. A leap is not a jump. When you jump, you go straight up and land in the same place. But when you leap, you jump and you land in front of you. God is about to touch families at Quest Church in such a way, watch, that you are about to leap out of your current condition and land in a new position. I'm going to say it again. God is about to touch families at Quest Church. And you are going to leap, not jump. Enough jumping. You are going to leap out of your current condition and land in a future position that is a promise and a prophecy to you and your family. Can you receive that today? If you can, give God praise. I'll, I'll end with this. Let's all stand. David said it like this. I love this. Psalm 1829. This is powerful. David said it like this. For by you, that's not by you where you fish. <laughs> For by you, I can run through a troop and leap over a wall. Listen to me. You are the deer. You are the coriante. Quit looking at three foot walls. And saying, I have to stay in here when you have the power in you to run through troops and leap over walls. The enemy has enclosed you long enough. I need you to shout as loud as you can. I'm bigger than this. Now let's back it up with I'm better than this. Amen. God created you to explore. God created you to be adventurous. God created you to get out there and become the best version of you that you could ever imagine. And the devil has sold you a lie and tell you you don't have that kind of power. I came to tell you you do have that kind of power. God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all you can ask or think. Give him something to work with. Amen. How many of you are ready to leap forward into your future? You're tired of jumping up and down in the same place. If you're really ready, come on, give God a big shout of praise today. I say this all the time. When you remove gravity, when you remove gravity, you go to take a normal step. You just, but there's no gravity. So what happens? You land somewhere way out in your future. When you start tapping into the power of God that lives inside of you and you go to make a move, somebody shout, I'm going further than I ever dreamed. 